friends, Tony Ackerman here. Today I'm inviting you to travel back with me to the 1950s to hear how I fell in love with the guitar. And as I talk about me, I suggest you think about you. What pulled you into trying stuff? What pointed you to your deepest self? And for you parents and teachers, how can you best help kids to find themselves? Let's begin with my favorite quotation. It's by Martha Graham, the great 20th century pioneer of American modern dance. She had the courage to throw away the obsolete trappings of ballet, the frilly skirts, the pointy shoes, the tired fairy tales, and she redefined what it meant to express yourself through movement. I'm going to say the words slowly, so you have time to let them sink in and see how they resonate. I even suggest you close your eyes while listening. There is a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And since there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. If you block it, it will never exist through any other medium. It will be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly, to keep the channel open. Hmm. Wow, deep down, we all know the truth of this. Yet doesn't our culture constantly try to hammer in the opposite message? If you are lucky enough to have had any teacher or any older relative or mentor who truly believed in your uniqueness and helped you to find out who you really are, I'll bet you remember them. I was really lucky that the two people who most inspired me and supported me to find my passions early on were my parents. Now that they are gone, and I have been first a parent, now a grandparent, I wish I had made more time to say thank you. I was born in Rome, in Italy, a city that has shaped me in so many periods of my life. In 1950, just five years after World War II had left Europe in ruins, my father, then an aspiring art historian, took my mother from her budding career as a modern dancer in New York City to go rummage around the Vatican City archives and discover Michelangelo's earliest architectural drawings. In 1950, it was just accepted that the husband's career took precedence. So, time for my mom, who was actually taking classes with Martha Graham and was an understudy in her company, to have babies. My sister was born in New York, and I was lucky enough to plop into the world in Rome. We'll return to Rome in a later episode. Back in the USA, Berkeley, California, a flowery college town on the hills across the bay from my father's native San Francisco. My mother was just reviving her career. One evening, she came home from the rehearsal of her own choreography at the Palace of Fine Arts, took me on her lap to give me some orange juice. I was not yet two, when she was suddenly stricken by a terrible pain and complete paralysis. She was barely able to croak out a cry for help to my father. It was polio, a dreaded disease that was ravaging the world, but for which the vaccine had just been invented. She missed it by a few months. My mother lived the rest of her 65 years in a wheelchair, unable to walk, but she learned to swim and drive, raised three children, including my sister, who was born after the polio, and take up many activities and causes. She worked with women's groups for peace and disarmament, 
tried her hand writing children's books, learned to edit films, and even made quilts. But the dance was, of course, struck down. I often think that my music has been in part a way to keep alive my mother's artistic expression. She created art, and my father wrote and talked about it, and I became a musician and teacher. Hmm, interesting. But the best gift parents can give a child is not so much their own activities and passions. Rather, it is support for the child to grow her own. Go back to your own childhood. Put your parents in mind. Did they notice what lit you up? How you danced around the living room coffee table? How you couldn't stop dribbling every ball in the house? How you spent hours on the floor with your crayons and old paper? And then, how did they nourish these sparks of joy? Or not? In Western culture, it's more normal to focus on the not. All of us have a deep mine of grievance around that. But that sense of lack often obscures what your parents did give you. If you have had small children or taken care of small children for just a few hours, you know how much energy, physical and mental, it takes just to feed a child, just to keep her safe and healthy. So on top of this support for survival, what did your parents do to encourage your loves, your learning? The first great thing my parents did for me when I was just three was to get me my own child's record player. I would sit on the floor for hours, leaning down into the tiny speaker to see if I could see those little men inside, hooting, crooning, drawling, and of course, playing guitars. This is one of my earliest records. It had several singers singing what we call folk songs, which in the 1950s often just meant one guy singing, accompanied by guitar, lyrics from the life of workers, farmers, railroad men. A three-year-old won't understand most of those illusions, but what a great way to start learning about American life. Woody Guthrie, America's traveling troubadour during the Great Depression. He rode boxcars, stayed in migrant workers' camps, sang on porches, at campfires all across the country. He was Bob Dylan's first inspiration. Of course, I didn't know any of that back then. But what I did here, as I put down the needle, was the guitar playing the melody on the bass notes. Chords above, barely audible above all those scratches and pops. Somehow, this gentle combination of low melody and high chords just pleased me. This land is your land, and this land is my land. And then the song, in that plaintive drawl, this land is your land, which for many of us is the real American national anthem. If you didn't know it before, you may have heard Jennifer Lopez singing it at Biden's inauguration a couple months ago. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. The same record was another singer, Pete Seeger, a towering figure in American music. He brought folk songs and styles from the rural South and West into cities and college towns, into living rooms everywhere, and even into my own little child's record player. He sang traditional songs, ballads, peace songs, folk songs, protest songs. He was a master at having the audience sing along with him. And of course, lots of children's songs. This one I've sung for my whole life, first to my own little sister, then to my own children, and now to my grandchildren. 
when I first came to this land. When I first came to this land, I was not a wealthy man. So I got myself a shack, and I did what I could. And to call my shack, break my back. But the land was sweet and good, and I did what I could. Pete Seegers, like my musical nanny. Land, I was not Listen to the a voice. So Even though I the range goes high, cow, it has such a depth, and, and it soothes. He played guitar, 6 and 12 string, but here he's accompanying himself with the 5 string banjo, which also caught my 4 year old ear, with its galloping rhythm and plaintive drone on the upper string, adding brilliance to the chords. Seeds strewn upon the fertile earth of my young ears and heart. I started piano lessons at age four, but we're saving that to the next episode, because things really started moving when, at age eight, a guitar appeared under the Christmas tree. Thank you again, Mom and Dad. I made my first two chords on December 25th, 1958. C, whoops, that was G7, C, and G7, one finger each. And I still remember my first song. <clears throat> oh, where have you been, Billy boy, Billy boy? Oh, where have you been, charming Billy? I have been to see my wife, she's the joy of my life. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. <laughs> oh boy, I wish I still had that old Stella red guitar. The cheapest guitar imaginable. High action, always out of tune. But, you see, it didn't stop me. Ha. Huh. Now this. This is an acetate, a homemade recording my uncle made of me when I was 10 years old, 1960. He lived in my mother's town of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Guitar lovers, does this ring a bell? Kalamazoo is also home to the Gibson factory, which I got to tour several times on later visits. Now here I'm playing and singing, in my very high voice, a lumbering song called The Frozen Logger. Step right up here to the microphone, please, Tony, and let her go. Take it away. As I sat down one evening, was in a small cafe, a four-year-old waitress to me these words to say. I see that you are a logger and not just a common bum, because nobody but a logger I got so much from recording this episode. I had meant to cover much more time, at least up through my teenage years, but every time I listened to an old song or shined a light on an old photo, it was like each memory just opened up to others. Other sounds, other sights, other people, other smells, other stories. Each memory became a diamond in itself shining with the reflection of everything around it. You know, you should try this yourself. Write, collect some photos, do a video for your children or your grandchildren about your early years. You'll learn so much. You'll have a great time, and so will those who listen to it. I hope you had a good time with me going back there. Now, do listen to some of the originals that I've put on the links in the description, including my own Goodnight Irene, which is a tribute to Lead Belly played on all five of these guitars at once. Let's end with some music. I recently watched 
a wonderful live concert video called Down from the Mountain, recorded in Nashville around 2000 with some of our greatest folk and country singers. John Hartford begins it by singing The Big Rock Candy Mountain. I used to love that song back when I was three or four, but somehow forgot about it all these years, didn't sing it to my children and grandchildren. Thank you, John Hartford, for bringing it back. Let's try a couple of verses. <clears throat> Gave a hobo hiking and he said, boys, I ain't turning. I'm headed for a land that's far away beside that crystal fountain. I'll see you all this coming fall in the big rock and the mountain. Oh, the birds and the bees in the cigarette trees by the soda water fountain. By the lemonade springs where the bluebird sings in the big rock and the mountain. Never change your socks. Little streams of alcohol come a trickle down the rocks. The box farms are all empty and the barns are full of hay. There's a lake of stew and ginger ale too. You can paddle all around it in the big canoe, in the big rock and the mountain. Oh, the buzzing of the bees and the cigarette trees by the soda water fountain. And the lemonade springs by the bluebird sings in the big rock and I'll be back next weekend with piano, blues, and bluegrass. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Be well, my friends. <laughs>